Hey everyone, Colin here with the Bible Uncut and Unfiltered. For a while now, I have had several different people asking me about my Bible study methods. What do I do? What is my setup? How exactly do I go about studying a passage of scripture uh, for the podcast? So this is something I've wanted to do for a while. It's a little bit of a bonus here. Um, but I want to take some time and just walk you through what my Bible study process looks like. And I want to say a few things about this here up front. First off, this is not scripted. So I am just going to go through basically as if I was studying a text for the first time for this study and just let you follow along and see exactly what I do with it. Right now, as I'm recording this, we are getting ready to go into our Ecclesiastes series with the podcast. So I have been already going ahead and studying this, but I'm going to walk you along as if I am doing the study for Ecclesiastes 1 for the first time, because I am actually still in the middle of that right now, so it it's appropriate. I also want to say, this is not prescriptive. I am not trying to tell you the one right way to study the Bible with this. This is just uh, hopefully to help you maybe get some ideas, uh, maybe introduce you to some resources that you may not uh, be aware of, but this is just what works for me. It may very well not work for you, or what will probably happen is you'll see my study and then you'll take little bits and pieces from it and adapt yours based on that. So please don't feel like you have to upend whatever your Bible study is and match mine exactly. That is not the point of this in any means. The best Bible study method is whichever one helps you understand and make sense of the Bible best. So that's going to be different for everyone. And this is just a little bit of what has worked for me. So you will see up on the screen here, Lagos Bible Software. I have talked about this a couple times on the podcast. I am a huge fan of Lagos. And while this is not sponsored by Lagos or particularly about the software, this is not a video explaining Lagos, I do have to mention it here at the front because my Bible study goes nowhere without Lagos. Now, you can absolutely do good Bible study without it, but I have been using Lagos now for almost 10 years, and it has just become like my right hand in Bible study. I literally keep it up and running on my computer every day. Whenever I have any kind of note or thought on anything Bible-related, I plug it into Lagos. I use this to check uh, the meanings of words. Whenever I'm doing anything related to the Bible, Lagos is involved. So if you are able to get a copy of Lagos, it would help your Bible study tremendously. I cannot recommend it enough. Now, there are a couple downsides. One is it can be expensive, particularly when compared to certain free software out there, something like Uversion or Blue Letter Bible. If you use a Mac, I think Accordance is available. I don't think that's available for PC users. There used to be Bible Works, but that went out and got bought out by Lagos, and anyway, it, it wasn't that great in the first place, at least in my opinion. But Lagos can be a little pricey. There is a free version that anyone can get, and it will give you some basic Bible tools that, personally, I think are better than any of the other options out there, better than, certainly better than something like Uversion. Uversion isn't going to get you in the original languages. It's just going to give you multiple Bible options in English or your spoken or reading language, which is great. It's just a different tool than what we're looking for here. I don't have much experience with Accordance, but I know uh, from people who have used it that Lagos can do everything and anything Accordance can do, and then some, and better. So really the only upside to Accordance, I guess there's two. One is it is a little bit cheaper than Lagos, and the other is if you are a person who likes Apple products, it has more of that Apple streamlined, like it comes out of the box, exactly how it's used. Lagos, while it can be used on Mac, is, I want to say, more of a PC mindset, like it is very customizable. You can just go with the flow of it, how it comes out of the box, quote-unquote, but you can also turn it into whatever you want it to be. And I like that. I'm a PC user. I'm using this on Windows 11 right now, and this just works really well for me on that system. So this, you will be able to do some things in a free version. The paid versions are like one-time payments. It's not a monthly subscription, although they do, I think they do have something, I think they still have it. It's through the parent company, Faith Life. 
that might allow you to try out some features in like a monthly subscription sort of format. But Lagos is available in all different forms, uh, anything from, you know, about a hundred bucks all the way up to several thousand. And I, I think every penny put into it is worth it. But even if you are just looking to expand your Bible study or do it better, even just the cheapest versions of Lagos that you can get are worth it. They will help 100%. The only other downside to it is there is a learning curve. This is not something that as soon as you get out of the box, and I keep saying that, but it, you know, it's all digital, you know, as soon as you power it up and download it, you're not going to understand and appreciate all of its features at once. That's why there are all different sorts of resources online, both through Lagos and through third parties that help to teach the software. Uh, I'm a part of a group called the Lagos Daily Circle. They are available on Facebook. I act as one of the coaches and moderators in that group. So if you are interested in Lagos, I definitely recommend checking that out. So I will do my best to explain things as I go through if it wouldn't make sense, like if you don't know Lagos. But this is absolutely something where some of these features are just going to be available further on down the paid line. I have put many, many, many hundreds of, of dollars into this software just because that's that's what I do, is Bible study, so it helps me do my job better. So if I'm just going into Ecclesiastes 1 for the first time, I'm going to pull up here on my screen Ecclesiastes, and I just have to type in, I don't even have to type in the whole book name, just ECC, I probably could have even just done ECC. Boom, takes me right up to Ecclesiastes. Now, I tend to keep the King James up as my base Bible. There's a few reasons for that. I am not King James only but I grew up in a very King James only environment where we believed that the King James was the only inspired English Bible. It was the only good English Bible. Everything else was a perversion of scripture. I do not believe that anymore. I have not in several years. However, I grew up for almost 20 years of my life only using the King James. And so all of the scripture that I memorized is King James. A lot of the people that I work with are still in a King James only circle or grew up using it as well. So I've found that it's kind of a good baseline for a lot of people. There are a lot of people who are familiar with the language of the King James. I mean, if you go to a funeral today and Psalm 23 is read, it's probably going to be from the King James. That's what a lot of people know. So it kind of gives me a baseline to work with people and not so much offend the ones who might be in a King James only background. And also because overall it is a good translation, specifically word for word. Like it lets me get into saying, oh, this word could have been translated this way, or I like how this was translated, or maybe this should have been translated. Just because of its setup as a formal equivalence translation, it does that better than some dynamic ones for this kind of study. I am not against dynamic Bible translations. In fact, uh, I find some of them quite helpful. In this Ecclesiastes study, I read a book, it was called Ecclesiastes, I think it was Annotated and Explained, I don't remember the author's name, but he gave a very dynamic translation of Ecclesiastes that I thought was fantastic, one of the best Ecclesiastes translations I've ever read. But you'll see King James up here, just because that's kind of my baseline, and I like to use that because it's the way my brain still thinks. But you can have whatever... Bible version up for this that you like. I do recommend using one that is more of a formal equivalency word for word if you're doing this kind of Bible study. Uh, there is a place for doing the dynamic ones as well, and I'll talk about that in a minute here. Um, next to this, I have the Hebrew set up. Uh, I am not fluent in Hebrew, but I did take enough of it in um, my master's degree that I am able to understand it decently. And definitely with the help of a tool like Lagos, I can uh, make out what I need to for it in study. And then over here on the right side, I have a notes panel. This is where I'll take any kind of note that I think of in my Bible study. So you'll notice here in the Bible section, there are all these little yellow sticky notes. If I hover over them, it shows you what exactly is there. Those are any notes that I have taken before. So this could be you know, I'm in, a, I'm in a church service and someone's preaching on Ecclesiastes. I can take a note specifically on this 
and save it for later. So it's like sermon notes, but tagged specifically in the text. It's like putting notes in the margin of your Bible, but it's an endlessly wide margin Bible. Like you can put whatever you want in there. And all I have to do for that is I right click whatever the word is and I can do this, add a note right here and I can choose from several different notebooks I have put it in, link it specifically to this word, and it shows up there. So that's super helpful. And that's going to be a good bit of what you see me doing is actually going back through my old notes here and seeing uh, what I want to focus on for Ecclesiastes. So just for the sake of time, so you don't have to watch me wandering around aimlessly, before I get into actually doing these notes, there is some study that I will have already done. Now, different people will tell you different things when it comes to Bible study. The way that I grew up, people used to say, and I'm sure some still do, that you should read the text itself and you should take your own notes first before you look at any commentaries or anything like that because then the commentaries will color your perception of the text. And I understand where they were coming from with that. There is something to that. However, I have come to take a different view on that, and here's why. I realized that a lot of people who have grown up in America and have any kind of religious history, even if they didn't go to church that much, if they at least know the basics about the Bible, they already have preconceptions built in that they don't realize are there. So when you go ahead and read the text, you are not just reading the text, you are reading with it the assumptions that you bring along that you don't know you have. So the whole idea of reading the text before the commentaries was to get like the pure meaning of the Bible before you get anybody else's opinion. But the problem with that is you can't just get the pure unadulterated message of the Bible without any bias because you are bringing your own bias into it without even realizing it. There are aspects of culture that you may not realize are affecting your view of a passage and it may or may not be what the text actually meant so i personally find it helpful to do some of the commentary and background study first that way it tells me the things that i don't know i don't know there's a reason whenever we do these podcast series we start with an episode called the stuff you don't know you don't know because that helps us to learn the context the things that i might have been blind to in the passage that would make me misunderstand or misinterpret the verse. So I personally argue for looking into some of the background studies before you go into the text yourself. That way you can be a more informed reader of the text going in. So one of the first things that I'll do whenever I go to study any passage of scripture is I'm going to uh, look at what the Bible Project has on it. Bible Project is fantastic. Uh, their resources are so well made. They're very professional. They're very engaging. They're very, they're, they're packed with all kinds of information without being overwhelming. And they're also very non-denominational. They try their best not to land on one side of an issue or not as much as possible so that as many people interested in the story of the Bible as possible can learn from them without feeling like there's a bent toward any particular doctrinal bias. So I really appreciate the work that they do. And they have short, like five to 10 minute videos on every book of the Bible, and they're still making stuff. So they're they have shorter videos, they have podcasts, they have all kinds of stuff on all different passages of the Bible now. So when I was going to do the Ecclesiastes study, one of the first things I did is I went to YouTube and I typed in Bible Project Ecclesiastes and I saw their explainer video on the book of Ecclesiastes. I saw they have a wisdom series explaining Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job all in conversation with each other. So that absolutely helped me there. I was able to go back, check their podcast, and listen to the episode that they had on Ecclesiastes there. And then I will start just Googling particular scholars that I appreciate their work with whatever it is I am looking for. Uh, so for example, I really like the work of Michael Heiser. I reference his work a lot on the podcast, especially on anything in like the Divine Council sort of stuff, uh, like Genesis 6 that we talked about. So I would just type in Michael Heiser, Ecclesiastes and just see if anything comes up. In that particular case, he really didn't do much of anything on Ecclesiastes. I think there was one like question response 
episode from his podcast where he mentioned like one verse out of Ecclesiastes. So that was about all that came up. I might do the same thing with someone like Bart Ehrman or T. Den's Bible for Normal People. And they did have an episode on Ecclesiastes, so I was able to look at some of the stuff that they had. I'm also going to go to a site like Best Commentaries and look at what people have referenced as the best commentaries on any book of the Bible. That's a great site. I'll link to that in the notes. So it's I think it's just bestcommentaries.com, and it gives you the top-rated by users commentaries on every book of the Bible, also on some topics. So it's totally done by people, normal people, just like us, that go on the site and say, hey, this was the best commentary I found for this. So that's really, really cool. Lagos has a part on their website I can link to as well that gives the best resources that, in their opinion for every book of the Bible. So I looked at that for Ecclesiastes. A lot of times Bible commentaries can be expensive, particularly if you are trying to get a good one. This is where it's important to say that not all Bible commentaries are created equally. There are multiple different sorts. There are devotional commentaries, something where it's going to be shorter, a little more pithy, a little more focused on like Proverbs, not like the book of Proverbs, but little life sayings, aphorisms, stuff that you can take away and make you feel a little bit better for the day. There's going to be expositional commentary, stuff that is focused at preachers to give them maybe like an outline suggested for potential sermon topics. There are more exegetical ones that focus on getting into the actual language of the text and drilling down and trying to figure out what particular words mean. There's background studies, there's study Bibles, there's Bible notes like the Net Bible Notes. There's homiletic ones also focused on preaching. There's concise ones that try to maybe get all books of the Bible into one large volume. You know, there are different series. So all, all different sorts of commentaries. And there, it's not necessarily that one commentary style is better than another. It's all going to depend on what you're trying to do for this particular study. You know, if you're doing a short devotional at a prayer breakfast or something at a church, you're probably going to want a devotional commentary. If you're preaching, you might want something a little more expositional or homiletical. For the type of study that I like to do, I focus on the exegetical ones, the study Bibles, the background commentaries, the, the Bible notes, uh, like the net Bible notes, stuff like that. So that's more what interests me. I'm looking for things that are going to get me either the background that I wouldn't know or the linguistics, the stuff about the actual language that maybe I would not know. But those are going to be more technical. They're going to be more scholarly. Some of them are going to require at least a base level understanding of Greek or Hebrew, depending on which testament you're in. Uh, some of them will transliterate, where they'll give English letters for the Greek or Hebrew words, uh, so that can kind of help you if you don't really know the words. Um, but some of these commentaries I was even using before I learned Greek and Hebrew, so it's not like it totally shuts off your access if you don't know it. It's going to be a little bit of a handicap, but it is still possible to use them. You just have to learn to filter out what exactly you're looking for. And I guess, you know what, here, let me show you a little bit of what I'm talking about. Let's pull up this Ecclesiastes commentary here. This is this will give a really good example of what I'm looking for. This is the Believer's Church Bible commentary, particularly here for Ecclesiastes. So let's just go here. We can look at anything here. Let's see. This one it doesn't look like it's going to be quite as technical. I don't really see Hebrew words mentioned in here. It looks like I saw a couple of transliterations. Like here, the word gain, yitron, ten times in the book. So this is going to just transliterate the Hebrew word yitron so you're able to read it better in English there. Let's see. I think maybe the Interpretation Bible Commentary has some of the original words. Hmm, maybe not as much. Okay, I thought they got a little bit more into some of the 
the, the Hebrew words there. I do definitely recommend the interpretation commentary. That is one that I really like, and I am still at this point going through for Ecclesiastes, but I, I tend to really like that series. I know what I can show you is the Net Bible Notes. This isn't as much a commentary as it is translation notes on the Net Bible. I think the Net Bible either comes with Lagos in the base package or it's pretty cheap. I highly, highly recommend getting this. I think you might also be able to get the Net Bible notes online, if I remember correctly. If you just search for like Net Bible, I think it's on a website that you can access uh, for free up there as well. So the Net Bible notes are for the entire Bible. It's essentially just the translation notes that the translators of the Net Bible, which is the uh, New English translation, I believe, they just put all of their translation notes into this huge volume and it is tremendously helpful. It is nerdy. It is something where you have to appreciate language to really get the most out of it, but it's very helpful. So this here gives you a good illustration of how some of these commentaries will use the Greek or Hebrew words, and you just kind of have to learn what to look for. So if you're looking at this and you don't know Hebrew, all of this is going to look f completely foreign to you, and that's okay. In some ways, you can start to recognize patterns like there might be some words where just by seeing the way they look you start to recognize them like even before i knew hebrew uh, i was able to recognize a word like tov good just because i had seen it enough times and stuff that i had read that i'm like okay i know what that is even though i don't know why it is that and greek's easier with that because greek script looks closer to english here's a good example of it ecclesiastes you can see here so it kind of looks like english letters a little bit Hebrew is going to be a little bit different because it's a totally different script and it's read right to left. But this is still something where even if you don't know Greek or Hebrew, you can figure out what it means enough to get something out of the commentary. And you're going to have abbreviations of other commentaries and lexicons and dictionaries like Halot or BDAG or uh, IBHS. So you're going to have a lot of technical stuff like that. You're going to have Bible translation abbreviations. Uh, you're going to have references to other passages. This is something I love about using these resources in Lagos is they tag everything. So if the commentary references a passage, like here, uh, I'm in Ecclesiastes 1.1 in the notes, but I can hover over Ecclesiastes 12, 9 to, 12, uh, 9 to 10 there in the commentary, and it shows me, it pops up right here on the screen with those verses. I could also click on it. And boom, it takes me right there. So that's a great feature of using Lagos. But that's just a little bit in some different commentaries explaining what to look for and what to use. So that's a little bit of the background of what I do to learn the context. So I'm going to look at Bible Project. I'm going to look up some other scholars. I look up something like Bible for Normal People. And then I start looking through things like the Net Bible Notes. I start looking at some different commentaries, like the World Bible Commentary or the Interpretation Series. There is a fantastic app called Hoopla, H-O-O-P-L-A, and you just link it to a library card, and it gives you access to thousands upon thousands of ebooks, audiobooks, comic books, even some movies and music and it's not all just christian stuff but they have a lot of christian stuff on there sometimes including commentaries when you start going into some of these better commentaries like the ones i've talked about here they can be pricey uh these aren't the sorts of things that you're necessarily going to find at a garage sale or goodwill for five bucks you know these can run uh man 50 to several hundred dollars sometimes even for just one volume it, it can be insane uh, but I was able to find some of these good commentaries on Hoopla for free because I have a library card and I was just able to access it. You borrow it for like three weeks at a time and then you can go back and borrow it again. So that absolutely saves money. It's helpful. Lagos oftentimes has sales and they bundle into series. They can make it cheaper. So there are ways that you can access some of these more expensive commentaries without necessarily having to shell out an arm and a leg. But I will say, go for the better quality ones. Like, the commentaries that you're going to find online for free uh, or on something like, um, uh, what's the site called? Blue Letter Bible. Blue Letter Bible has some free commentaries available. 
just being totally honest with you all, they're kind of not great. I want to be respectful toward the Bible students and scholars and commentators who have come before me, but a lot has changed in Bible study in the past 200 years. And the reason that you're going to find many of those commentaries free online is because copyright has expired. They are free because they are old. And what a lot of people don't always understand is that Bible study is not static. We did not learn everything there was to know about the Bible 200 years ago, or 500 years ago, or at the Reformation, or in the time of Spurgeon and Moody and all those people. Bible study continues to grow and develop, and particularly in the last 1 to 200 years, we have found an incredible amount of new ancient writings, and there's been all kinds of archaeological discoveries in the Middle East to help us learn the context of the ancient Near East. So a lot of the stuff that you're going to find in free commentaries available online is all before that boom in understanding ancient Near Eastern culture. So it's going to be a lot of devotional content, and it's going to be very preachy. Honestly, if you read one of those free commentaries, you will have read them all. They all basically say the exact same thing. They're going to say the exact same kind of thing that you've heard in church your entire life and from your pastor. And the reason for that is a lot of pastors use those free resources because, well, pastors ain't exactly rich most of the time. So they don't have the money for good commentaries. They go with whatever free stuff they can find. And you see enough of those free commentaries and you think, well, this is everything there is to know on this passage. This is what everybody's saying about it. And you don't realize that's what everybody was saying about it 200 years ago. We actually have a lot better scholarship available today. You just have to find creative ways to access it, maybe by using something like Hoopla or buying something like Lagos. Like you have to put a little bit of effort and money into it in order to do good scholarship. You can't just go off of the free stuff, unfortunately. But thankfully, there are free resources like Bible Project, Bible for Normal People, our podcasts that are trying to increase the access of these scholarly things to people who don't normally know about it or want to pay for that sort of thing. So we are getting there, but it's slow. So yeah, I'll go into the commentaries. And then I will try to read in some different versions. Um, I will say, even if you come from a background like I did that was King James only, or you have only ever used one version, maybe an NIV or ESV or something like that, like it's totally okay to have a preferred version. But when you're doing Bible study, it is very, very helpful to study multiple versions of Scripture. Even the Bible itself says that in the multitude of counselors, there is wisdom, there is safety. There's a reason for that. We're able to see different perspectives on the text when we see different translations. And in a book like Ecclesiastes, that is actually very important because Ecclesiastes can be a very difficult book to translate. There's all different kinds of grammatical nuances to it. So reading different Bible versions can really help you understand different perspectives. And I would recommend at least three to five and vary them. Don't just do like King James, New King James, MEV, ESV, and NIV. Like branch out. I'll show you what I do right here in Lagos. I am able to use a parallel text tool, which should be right here. Uh, yeah, text comparison tool. And I am able to set up several different versions of the Bible all side by side and see how they each translate. So it goes off of my base of the King James. I have the ESV, the NASB, ASV, the Good News Bible. That's, what is NCV? I don't, oh, New Century Version, Young's Literal, that's an old one. Christian Standard Bible, Modern English Version, NIV, International Standard, Net Bible, New Living Translation, Revised Standard, Complete Jerusalem Bible, Lexham English Bible, and The Message are just a few of the ones that I have set up here. And there's plenty of other options. So this lets me see as I do my study where there are major differences in translation. And when there is a big difference in translation, it helps me to know that's something I need to drill in further on and figure out why is there so much variety. Like, for example, if we just look right here in Ecclesiastes 1.1, I can look at this and go, okay, overall, the translations are similar, but I see a big difference here in preacher, philosopher, teacher, kohelet, 
Quester. That's a really interesting one that uh, Eugene Peterson went with in the message. So that's going to tell me I need to figure out a little bit more about this title of preacher, teacher, philosopher, Kohelet, uh, Quester. What exactly does that word mean and why is there so much translation difference? Let's keep going. Verse 2, something similar I can see. Okay, we have vanity of vanities, but then we have life is useless. Then we have useless, useless, completely useless. And we have absolute futility, absolutely pointless, utterly meaningless, absolutely futile, completely meaningless, utterly meaningless, nothing to it at all that's all smoke, smoke, nothing but smoke. So that's another situation where I go, okay, there's some big translation differences there. I'm going to need to figure out what's going on with this vanity of vanities. Like, what does that actually mean, and why are people translating it so differently? Let's see here, verse 3. We have toil, we have labor, we have work. So that kind of helps me get a little bit more of a nuance of what that word might be. Same thing here at the start of the verse. We have advantage, profit, what do people gain? So I might want to look into that a little bit. And I can just go verse by verse trying to see what things stand out to me as something I should study a little bit more. And I'm probably going to take notes on each one to look into it a little bit more. What I do with that is within Lagos, you can create sermons. And I use the sermon documents for everything. So even for the podcast notes, I use the sermon documents. So I'll pull up for you here. This is documents tab in Lagos. I have all different types of documents, but you can see I've already made up several for each chapter. So I'll do one for Ecclesiastes 1, 2, 3, all the way through chapter 12. So let's pull up Ecclesiastes 1, since that's where we are. And I'll just title it with Ecclesiastes 1. I give a subheading of notes, and then I just start going through. I put up a little subheading for each verse, you know, chapter 1, verse 2, chapter 1, verse 3, chapter 1, verse 6, whenever I find some interesting notes. So I just plop it in like that. I've already looked through the Net Bible at this point, and something that I'll do with that is as I find something that interests me, uh, let's just use an example here, I will take it, there we go, (laughs) glitching on me for a second, I will take it and uh, highlight with my mouse, control C for copy, come over here, control V for paste. And so now I don't have to pull up the Net Bible anymore. It's like the old days of being in high school when you had to take note cards of different stuff, but I just copied and pasted directly in. So now I have that in my notes. I know that I want to reference that at a later point. And so, yeah, as I go through this and I see these different things, like in the text comparison, I'll make a note here. Oh, verse 1, look up a little bit more about Koheleth, preacher, teacher, that sort of thing. Look up a little bit, you know, verse 2, look up vanity, see exactly what this is. So I'll keep track of that. Uh, Within Lagos, I can also do all these different tags, say what series it is, what the number in the series is, topics I address, passages. I can tag it so I can find it more easily later. Uh, I can give the date that I uh, give this sermon, quote-unquote, or for me it would be the day that the podcast releases so uh, I can fill all that in later, but that's that's really helpful in Lagos too. But yeah, I'll just also go through the translation start to finish. So like I might read it start to finish all 12 chapters in the King James in one sitting, and then I might jump to something like the NASB or something like the message to give a totally different take on it. And I do that with several different translations, and I'll make notes of what stands out to me as, oh, wow, that doesn't sound like how I remember it being taught. Like, that's a really unique way, and maybe I'll want to draw that out in the podcast and say, oh, you know, Eugene Peterson has a really creative way of saying this in the message, or ESV translated it this way, and I kind of disagree with their theology in this point, so here's why. So it gives me a chance to come at it from different angles as well there. And then I'll just pull up my... I'll just pull up Ecclesiastes here in my main Bible, and I will start going through and looking at the notes that I already have saved in it. So right now, I'm just going to walk you through a little bit of how I would actually look at chapter one and put in notes for it. So I'm just going to look at my first note here and see what do I have. It's going to pop up. This is actually, let's see, when did I take this note? Oh, a couple years ago. So a couple years ago, I was considering uh, doing an Ecclesiastes series at my church, and I tried to pitch it, and it just it never happened. So I'm excited to be able to do it in the podcast. This is something I've been wanting to do for quite a while. 
but I have notes from when I watched the Bible Project, TBP, their videos. So these are just some thoughts that I had from there. And I'm going to look at, okay, the one who gathers people together, that's Koheleth. Who is he? Is he different from the author? So this is helping me look back through stuff I've studied before and say, okay, these are future topics that I need to make sure I address when I do this study. Here's some stuff on comparing Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Job. So yeah, I'll, I will look through each of these lines and I will say, okay, these are things I want to address and I will plug them into my sermon set here on Ecclesiastes 1. Let's look at my next note. Okay, so this is something where I'm not sure exactly why this is here. I get weekly emails from uh, a guy by the name of James Clear. He wrote a book called Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits. It's a really good kind of self-improvement sort of book. It helps you form healthy habits, things like that. And uh, I kept track of some of the quotes that he sends out every week of stuff that I like. So uh, this is not something that more than likely should have been tagged with Ecclesiastes. Sometimes when I pull up a new note, it will link to whatever the last passage I was in was, and I may have just forgotten to take that down. But I don't know. Like, looking at the second quote here, people who jump from project to project are always dividing their effort, and producing high-quality work becomes difficult without intense effort. Meanwhile, your average day can be leisurely, yet also productive, if you return to the same project each day. Do one thing well and watch it compound. I mean, that kind of sounds like Ecclesiastes and some of the wisdom there, especially this next one here. Life is easier when you know what you want, but most people don't take the time to figure out what they want. Like, I don't know. Maybe maybe when I saw these quotes over two years ago now, uh, maybe I thought that kind of fit the message of Ecclesiastes. So I might actually leave that there and potentially use that for some inspiration. So get our third one. So I'm talking here about uh, the nihilism and the philosophy of it. So this is um, a an adapted quote I took from Bible Project. So let's look here. I'm going to look at the words, and I have Lagos set up so that whenever I highlight over a word with my mouse, I just hover over it, it shows me on both the left side, the English side, and the right side, the Hebrew side, what the word is. So even if I don't remember, oh man, what's the Hebrew word for word, and then I have to try to find it on the right, it highlights it exactly, and it also shows me where it pops up in other uh, verses that are still on the screen. So, like, you can see it's the word davar in Hebrew, but it's translated in verse 8 as things, verse 10 as thing. So this is going to be something that I might actually want to touch on, that davar uh, can mean word, or sometimes it means matter, and it gets translated as thing. Uh, let's hear the conclusion of the matter. It, it's sort of the same thing there. So I might want to I'll attention to that there. So like I'll I'll just make myself a note here. One one word Davar and I will come back to that and flesh that out a little bit more. Uh, preacher, I am going to have to touch on the meaning of Kohelet. Now I am going to do an episode of the stuff you don't know about Ecclesiastes or the stuff you don't know you don't know about Ecclesiastes, and in that I already know I'm going to talk about Koheleth, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on there but I am going to have to draw attention to that. I'm going to have to talk about his identity, and again, I'm going to do that in the introduction, uh, the whole Son of David, King in Jerusalem thing. There's two. Obvi obviously, I'm going to have to talk about vanity, uh, which is Hevel in Hebrew, but again, I'm going to bring that up in the introductory episode because that is such a common theme for the study. I feel like I have to put that at the top. Let's see. Prophet is another thing where I know that's a word I'm going to have to address. And this is just something from reading the commentaries and the Bible notes that I already know going into this as a very important word. So I'm going to have to make sure I address that in the introductory episode. Let's see, what prophet does a man have? And I'm going to check something like, what's the word for man here? Okay, it's a dom. So that's going to plug into Adam. You know, rather than just a male gender, it's talking about human there. What what profit does a human have of all his labor? So that's something I might want to actually address. Um, a dom for man. So that way I remember later on to say, oh, this isn't just talking about a male gender. It's talking about any human. What profit does any human have from their labor? Let's see, that's going to be a word I want to look into. I right-click the word, 
and it gives me a little bit of a definition. And then I can also pop up this Bible word study and it will pull up here every time this Hebrew word Amal shows up in the Old Testament and how it's translated in the King James. I have all these different dictionary definitions here. So this is something I'm going to want to look into a little bit more as well, is what does this labor mean? I'm going to have to address under the sun, and I'm not sure yet if that's something that I am going to talk about in an intro episode or now in episode one. So I'm going to make a note here for later me to say, uh, look into explaining what under the sun means. Let's see one generation do I, do I feel like I want to explain what generation is mm, yeah I might take a, a minute when I'm on here and talk about the meaning of generation so I'm gonna pop that up uh, let's see passes away that's interesting one generation walks so I, I may even mention that pass away I'll just say walks so this gives you a little bit of an idea of how I do this sort of thing. I'm just going through basically word by word, and I'm using the little bit that I know about Hebrew to say, okay, is this maybe a word that I was not expecting there? Is this going to surprise me? Like, I wasn't thinking that passes away was going to be the word halak for walk. Uh, now, it can mean to die, so it doesn't necessarily have to mean walk there. It obviously has the connotation of passing away or dying because uh, next line of it is about another generation coming onto the scene. I'm going to want to address that. Uh, let's see, I have my note here. So yeah, this is an interesting note that I had about how death is mentioned first. We might say come and go. We would think about the life you live and then uh, your death after that. But he talks about death first and then life. So this kind of puts death in the forefront and then says another generation comes after that. So I kind of like that note that younger me made. <laughs> And so I'm going to take that and I'm going to put that right here with a simple copy and paste. And that's what a lot of my Bible study here is, is, is compiling the old notes that I had together into one big document. So let's do this for another couple verses. Uh, another generation comes, but the earth, so that's Eretz, abides forever. So let's look at this abides. So that's going to be stands. And then this is probably going to be Olam, right? Yep, stands forever, stands for an age. Uh, that's definitely something I need to talk about. I need to address in this a little bit of what eternity is or forever because that means something a little bit different there than what we might think on our own. Let's look at verse 5. The sun, this should be Shemesh, yeah. Uh, that's what a lot of this is, is I'm just going by checking the words, looking for anything that stands out to me as unusual. So it's very tedious work. Uh, by going through some of these other commentaries already, and putting them in here, like with the Net Bible Notes, or I should have another one in here that I did. Maybe not in Chapter 1. Uh, I have other notes that I need to import in here from my Ecclesiastes study. Like, here, I will show you. Mm, I have to go here, I have to go here. And I'm going to find my Ecclesiastes notebook. There we go. So these are all the uh, notes I've taken related to Ecclesiastes so far. And let's look at uh, let's look at the Ecclesiastes annotated and explained. So this is when I was uh, going through that book. I took notes of all of the different things that he said that I thought I might want to focus on later. So I'm going to go through each of these and I'm going to say, okay, where does this best fit with the topic of Ecclesiastes? And then I'm going to go through copy and paste this into each each sermon quote unquote now as i went further on and he actually started going through the chapters i tried to take notes of where exactly this fit so like here's a note on chapter one verse three and he quotes uh, it's a hindu text i could be wrong so forgive me <laughs> look upon the world as you would on a bubble look upon it as a mirage all conditioned things are impermanent so he's using he even quotes from the gospel of thomas which really stood out to me. So this is kind of adding a different perspective onto a meaning of hevel or vanity. So I am actually going to cut this. I'm not just going to copy it because I don't want to lose track of what I've already put in 
uh, putting these notes in their own notebook just helps me later on. I don't necessarily want to keep them in the notebook. I want to put them in the sermon document for the podcast, but I just keep them in here until I get over there. So I'm going to cut out one three here, and I'm going to go back to the sermon, and I'm going to find where do I talk about Hevel. Okay, actually, I talk about that in chapter one, verse two, which is where it shows up. So I might have uh, the wrong number there. So I'm going to pop it in right here, wherever I think it fits best after the notes I already have in. Since these are quotes, I'm probably going to put them in after I've already talked a little bit about the meaning of the word. And I'm just going to clean that up a little bit. Put that there. And I'm going to make a note for myself that this came from annotated and I think it was explained. I'll have to double check that. But that way I know to reference these uh, information properly when I actually go ahead and put it on the website and everything. That uh, way I can avoid plagiarism and try to show how my work is. Like a general rule of thumb for study is if you can find the information in three to five sources, you don't need to cite it. Uh, as much as possible, and I mean, these are quotes, but these are quotes from other works, but I did not necessarily go and read the Dhammapada on my own. Uh, I want to be able to still credit the author of that book to say, hey, he's the one who found uh, the similarities between those quotes and Ecclesiastes, so I want to give him credit for that and make sure I, I get that in the proper notes there. So I am going to go through everything on here. Here's what I had on chapter 1, verse 5, and yep, that matches. It's talking about the sun. So I will absolutely copy that over here. Oops. Put it in here. I need to make a spot for 1.5. Put that there. Ecclesiastes. I'm just going to put annotated. That way I don't have to type it out every time. And later on I can go in and fix it and then copy and paste every time I uh, reference that work. So that's a lot of what I'm going to do here. Here's something from 1.7. Seeing and hearing. Does that match what 1.7 says? Um, actually, that matches, hmm, okay, that's actually verse 8. See, the, this is why I kind of have to check myself on stuff like this. Like, there's continual checks and balances in my study process where I go, all right, I, I put this here for this, but does this actually match what I'm trying to talk about in the text? So I try to fact check myself as I go through this and it saves me work later on. So I can go now, okay, that's verse eight that I need to put that in. So do I have anything for verse eight yet? I do. All right, let's put that right here then and do Ecclesiastes annotated. And let's see, I don't know if I can even make this up on the fly, but as I'm going through, if I find something where I have a preconception in my mind where I think, oh yeah, this is what that's talking about. And it just seems so obvious to me, like, as I'm thinking this through, and a lot of times it's going, it's actually not going to come out until I actually go ahead and start recording the podcast, but I will actually stop what I'm doing and I will fact check it. Like, if it feels too good to be true, if I am so certain about this, but I've never looked it up, that is a sure sign for me to say, you know what, I should do a Google search and just make sure that this is actually true. Because there are so many ideas in Bible study um, and sermon illustrations and things like that that just get passed around from person to person and no one actually takes the time to stop and fact check themselves. And all it takes is a little Google search. It takes, you know, two minutes to find out, am I right or wrong about this? A great example of this is the whole thing with Jesus talking about Gehenna in the New Testament, in the Gospels. Um, a, some of the older ones, like the King James, will translate it hell, but when Jesus spoke of it, it was almost always Gehenna, which was different than our idea of hell. That's a whole other conversation for another day. Uh, it was a transliteration of Ger Hinnom, or the Valley of Hinnom. 
And a lot of preachers will say something along the lines of, oh, the Valley of Hinnom was a trash dump outside of Jerusalem. It's It was just this constantly burning trash heap where people just threw all of their garbage out there and it burned and burned and burned and that's why Jesus used it as a threat of eternal punishment and fire. The problem with that is that's not true. <laughs> it's a very popular... I don't even know that's a sermon illustration. I, I guess it's more of a, a statement that preachers make. But all you have to do is a quick Google search to say, was Gehenna a trash dump? And you'll find out really fast that we only have one source for that. And it was some monk that lived, I'm going to say it was like a thousand years. It may have even been more uh, after Jesus. Like there is no record from that time to say that the Valley of Hinnom was a trash dump why that had the connotation of something burning, you actually have to go back to the Old Testament, uh, Tanakh, where it was used as a place of sacrifice, and particularly infant sacrifice. So we have to be careful of things like that, where we, I, it, it's just a mindset, like, I have to question myself on everything. As I'm writing the things down, I try to mentally check myself of saying, do I actually know that? Or is it just something that I have heard? And it's hard. It's a practice that you have to develop over time. Uh, it's just something I'd recommend. Like, everything that you write down, if you're going to speak it in public, fact check it first. Uh, that makes a really big difference in your credibility of being able to say this is actually accurate. And it sucks because sometimes it ruins your best preaching points. It removes the really pithy illustrations and quotes and stuff. Uh, we'd rather be accurate than pithy. <laughs> we want to make sure that what we're saying is on point. So I think that's, I'm probably going to stop there because I've been going at this for almost an hour now. And it, it gives you a pretty good illustration of what my Bible study is going to look like. Uh, of the preliminary work I do, and then a lot of it is just going literally word by word, checking do any of these words stand out to me as unusual. I'm able to do that a little bit faster because I do have some familiarity with the original languages. But even if you don't, Something like Lagos or even Blue Letter Bible is a tremendous tool for that. It will give you basic dictionary definitions without having to know the original language words. And it can tell you if maybe the word means something a little different than I thought it would. I'm going to look for key words that I want to make sure I focus on. I want to try to look at this in the sense of somebody who has not been studying it for the last month and digging deep into all these different commentaries. I want to imagine what would somebody coming off the street who has maybe never read Ecclesiastes think if they hear this sentence? Is there something that might not make sense? Do I have to explain this word? Is this something that maybe just based on what I know about the cultural context isn't going to match up with the English context, so I have to bridge the gap there? And that's something that just takes years of studying the Bible and the ancient culture, uh, taking the classes on it, reading the books on it, where you start to catch these things and go, okay, that's something that the average person might not recognize just on a first glance. Uh, and I'm going to copy and paste over the notes that I have taken from other sources. Some of them I am going to quote word for word later on. Others I am going to summarize. Uh, a lot of times I'll leave the full quote in my notes and then just summarize it when I actually uh, read it in the podcast. Uh, sometimes I'll look at the note and just have it there so I can reference this author thought this, but here's why I agree or disagree. Um, and then sometimes I'll just take notes on stuff that I want to dig into later, and I'll do the Bible word study uh, feature here in Lagos, or I'll start just Google searching. Uh, you know, Google is not infallible. Um, you have to weed through a lot of bad information. But for simple stuff, it can at least get you thinking in the right direction. Like, I I think it can be really useful. Even something like Wikipedia can be really useful for just understanding the base level stuff and maybe helping you get a more unbiased view of what something looks like outside of your own tradition and uh, mindsets. And then uh, I'll probably end up going over the passage again, maybe in the same version, maybe in a different version, just make sure there's nothing I missed. I'll go through my notes, I'll clean them up, see at this point now do I want to address something earlier on, later on, does everything match up with the right verse, uh, is there anything that I'm going to need to put like a note for myself for when I'm 
saying this on the podcast to address something else. And then when I actually go to do the podcast, I'll usually go for a walk, uh, sometimes for one or two hours, and I'll just think out loud. I'll, Lagos is available on my phone, so all of these notes that I've taken here, all the sermon stuff, it pulls up on my phone, and I'm able to just go line by line and kind of pretend as if I am doing the podcast for the first time. As you probably know, I can ramble <laughs> very easily, so if I can say it once by myself, no one listening, no cameras rolling, uh, lets me get all the ramble out. I can think, or at least some of the ramble out, <laughs> it lets me think through and verbalize these different thought processes, and I can go down the rabbit holes, and sometimes I'll go, okay, yeah, I need to flesh that out more. A lot of times I end up going, I am so glad I said this now and not on the podcast, because we would need to cut that whole thing out. It's totally unnecessary. And then I come back, and usually on the same day I try to do that, the same day or maybe the day before, I'll just go ahead and hit record. And then, you know, how I actually record the process is a, a totally different topic that's not what we're talking about here. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of start to finish on my Bible study, um, particularly for a podcast episode. So uh, obviously I have a lot more I have to do on chapter one here, but I don't want to bore you just sitting around watching me copy and paste stuff for the next two hours. But yeah, that, that gives you a good idea, and it's very time-consuming. This is something that takes hours upon hours of work. Some of it I'm able to uh, make a little bit easier by doing audiobooks or podcasts. Some of the stuff I just have to sit down and read, and it's filling up those little moments, like when you're waiting in line at the grocery store, or at the gas station, or... You know, before you go to bed at night, uh, while dinner's cooking or something, I'll just pull up one of the commentaries on my phone. I'll start highlighting stuff that stands out to me. And then later I can go back on my computer, because I like the desktop setup better, and I can just copy and paste the stuff into my notes that I need to. So it's a long process. I, I wouldn't even say it's tedious. It's just very time-consuming. And there are no shortcuts to it. There is no one-hour version of this. And really, it builds on years of Bible study. I and mean, like you saw, I'm taking from notes that I took two years ago, five years ago, eight months ago. Uh, that's why I really like this system of being able to keep the notes in Lagos, because uh, it, it gives me an easy reference with everything all in one place for later on. So, yeah, I hope that's helpful to you. Again, this is what works for me. Totally do what works for you, but look into some of these things and feel free to adapt and improvise uh, I've mentioned here and I hope it is a help to you in your Bible studies. So as you continue to study the Bible, stay curious and keep asking questions about the uncut and unfiltered Bible.